So tonight's program is an MSU's Now program. So like I said, tonight's program is multiple sclerosis and pregnancy or pregnancy and MS. And we will also talk about COVID. My name, for those that don't know, it's right there, Stuart Schlossman. All right, this program tonight is supported by MS Views and News, by Biogen and Gen and Tech. All right, we do want to thank our supporters always. And we always ask you to give a virtual round of applause. Oh, I hear it now. Okay, great. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Dr. Al Jolson Walker. And yes, wow, he was a stud back then. He's still a stud right now, but he was he was a good looking guy back then, too. Right. And, um, you know, tonight, like I said, he's going to be speaking about MS and pregnancy. And Dr. Walker is with the uh, MS MUSC, which is um, was it the Music University? No, it's not Music University. The, the Medical University of South Carolina. I, I know I was joking around. When I see M U S C, it just it just like looks like the word music. So that's why yeah. I say music. All right. So anyway, um, Dr. Walker, I'm not going to let him uh, sit back too much longer. We're going to let him get started. All right. So thank you, everybody, and Dr. Walker, take it away. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for this opportunity to to speak to everyone, and I hope everyone's feeling well and rested. And, for those who had the opportunity, I hope you've eaten already to some degree as well, just because it has gotten kind of late. Uh, for this evening presentation, we're going to be discussing uh, pregnancy. We also will be discussing some aspects of the COVID-19 update. I think there's actually a couple of things not updated in the slide set. We'll discuss those as well. But nevertheless, the primary uh, conversation is going to be about pregnancy and, and women. And once again, for um, a lot of patients, this comes up in conversation primarily because often when they're diagnosed, they happen to be um, in that uh, sort of prime age sort of circumstance where this becomes a strong consideration and concern as well. Moving on. We have no disclosures, ladies and gentlemen. We are really working for anyone and, and, and no paid uh, pay, uh, company situation at all. Thank you. For tonight's uh, presentation, the objective basically is once again to understand um, more so multiple sclerosis, its benefits from disease modifying therapies, and you know that as your, your gelinias and your tysabris and your uh, vumerity and so on and so on. And of course, there are about 20 plus now medications to treat MS. And I will tell you, it's a sort of a happiest time that you to be an MS specialist because you have so much now in your armamentarium to adjust that to patients while we originally had only a couple of medications to say the least. And then number point number two is just to identify where MS comes into this sort of situation when it comes to pregnancy itself and try to remove some of those uh, misconceptions, if you will, those missed ideas, things that aren't necessarily true. Moving on. Some of these slides are just sort of refresher for those who are joining you who aren't necessarily as um, learned and informed about this disorder. Multiple sclerosis, as you guys well know, is an autoimmune disorder. Um, from that point of view, similar to if a person had rheumatoid arthritis. And for, in fact, look, look, let's look at it from the point of view. If I have an individual that has MS, is he or she necessarily that different than a patient that has rheumatoid arthritis? Well, the primary difference is going to be that the MS patient is probably going to be between about averaging around 30 years of age. The rheumatoid arthritis patient, on average, is going to be maybe double that number, high 50, 60 years of age. And of course, we all know that there are exceptions to that sort of range, if you will, or average. But the other thing to keep in mind is this, is that where the MS patient has their immune system attacking, if you will, the insulation on their nerves, the rheumatoid arthritis patient has their immune system attacking the cartilage, the joint space. But the basic process is the same, the neighborhood to which they cause their effect, that's where the difference comes into play. And that's why it's commonplace to see that one of the risk factors or circumstances that we run into for the MS patient, when we do that history, is ask about their families. And what we tend to find is that they 
often come from families where there's a number of other autoimmune disorders like rheumatoid arthritis, like lupus, like sarcoidosis, like polymyalgia rheumatica, and so forth. A whole list of other possibilities, other autoimmune disorders that people run into that are different than MS, but similar as well as we explained. And one of the key things to keep in mind, too, is that when you're looking at MS as a disorder, you often wonder, okay, what is it? What causes it to be what it is? And, of course, there's a number of different complexes, diagrams. This one that you see in front of you, this is one of my favorites. It's, it's, a very, it's very old, to say the least. They've made some modifications to it. But in general, what it says is this. When that patient asks me the question, what causes MS? This pattern or something similar to this is what comes to mind. Meaning it is a complex series of circumstances involving that person's immune system causing a situation to which items in their peripheral blood would cross through this thing called the blood brain barrier. And when in doing so, crosses into the brain area then affects in particular the insulation on the nerves in their head that cause transmission of information from point A to point B. And when that interruption is complete, you may know that as I can't move my arm. If that if that interruption is partial, then you know that as my arm still moves but it's weak in that process. Or if it's partial, my arm feels numb. If it's complete, I can't feel my arm at all. Once again, giving examples of degrees of variability that also occurs as well at the same time. Moving forward. Pregnancy and multiple sclerosis. On average, a person is diagnosed probably in the high 20s, early 30s. And so as you might imagine, this is around the time that patients will often be considering pregnancy some earlier than this granted but this is on average when a person is diagnosed and a number of people have had potentially their first child in advance of this age but usually this is that time that it occurs in modern day and so because of that then the whole question of ms and pregnancy becomes hmm, a significant part of one discussion and of course when one looks at incidents from a gender point of view, who's more likely to get multiple sclerosis? Is it males or females? In some places report three to one, but the majority of them seem to report a two to one uh, risk when it comes to the, the gender aspect of it. And then, of course, you get into this issue of concern about, okay, so I have been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis as an example. Then what's the likelihood of my offspring, my children, my the first degree relative getting uh, MS as well. And there's a slight difference there as well because when you look at women, that number is close to three to four percent. You look at men, it's two to three percent. So it's not quite as frequently transmitted in men as it might be in women. But once again, there is some part of it, but it's not straight just that aspect of it. There's also this idea of environmental risk because keep in mind, as as always, until this, until this day still, we don't exactly know what causes multiple sclerosis. We have a sense of the effect of the disorder itself, but its actual cause, unknown. And so then once again, it brings up this whole issue, of course, of course then how does one diagnose it? Well, we have a sense of the mechanism, meaning that we got a sense of what happens in this process and then what things to look for per MRI, per spinal fluid analysis, per examination, and then per a given age group, what likely is the cause for that person's situation. Once again, these this sort of data assists us in a substantial way to the point that we often are able to come up with a diagnosis and be accurate when we, when we do so. Because of concerns about passing this disorder on, I think plays a role with why women who might have wanted three kids, four kids, may opt for just two or one. Concerns about postpartum. Most of you at some point have 
take an opportunity to speak with your healthcare provider or Google and noted that, hmm, there seems to be potentially an increased risk of a multiple sclerosis relapse or MS exacerbation in that postpartum period. And most of their original data suggested that. Later on, we're going to see where that's not necessarily true, but we'll discuss it in more detail. And potentially, maybe the person is not having more children because as they're taking their disease modifying therapy, they know that they have to stop it at a certain time, restart at a certain time, while they're off the medication, uh, attempting to get pregnant, they're at risk for an MS exacerbation. Once again, the, the so-called risk risk quotient at concern there as well. And then, hmm, will I be able-bodied enough to properly, in my estimation, rear my children how I want them reared if I end up in a wheelchair, have a significant gait disturbance, have a aspect of a cognitive component, a vision impairment, and so forth, have a great deal of pain when I move, and so forth. Once again, I think these are all the things that are being considered why potentially there's fewer women having um, significant numbers of children and some opting not to have any at all as well. But just keep in mind that MS in of itself does not seem to affect children as a, as a general rule. The, the mother, yes. The father potentially, yes. But the child is infrequently ever transmitted as a general rule as well. Okay. Vitamin D. Who doesn't like a like a vitamin? Vitamin D. Okay. Well, where are we? So way back, way back, 10, 15 years ago, vitamin D was touted to be a beautiful panacea, thought to make substantial inroads in terms of outcomes and change when it comes to multiple sclerosis as a disorder. It was thought that if a person had their vitamin D levels at 40 or greater, um, nanograms per per, per milliliter, that that individual had reduced risk of actually having an MS exacerbation. And then for the first few relatives, if you also started them on vitamin D supplement, they had a decreased risk of actually getting MS as well. So vitamin D was thought to be a, a substantial thing. In fact, um, one in particular of the MS medications, when a person was taking vitamin D supplement and using the MS medication, that tended to make the medication work better. They had a reduced relapse rate, uh, which was quite interesting to say the least. Some of the most more recent data, if you will, has not, has not been that conclusive, if you will, and, and agree with all of that. However, the majority of docs find that vitamin D in of itself is reasonably safe. Now keep in mind, I say reasonably safe. You can take too much of it and create liver issues. So you have to be reasonably monitored, particularly if you're taking very large amounts, that, that being the 50,000 uh, milligrams uh, or, or 50,000 as a dose per week. That's a, that's a fair amount. There, there you need to be monitored to make sure that there is no um, liver issues and that you're dosing, that you're not above some labs, say 100, um, some labs up, up to 80, 85. So once again, a concern from that point of view. And then a number of patients, because of the nature of their treatment considerations, they were on cytotoxic medications as such. Um, their fertility uh, aspects were probably or potentially negatively impacted. So it's not that they don't want to have more children, um, the ability uh, has been negatively impacted. So once again, that happens as well. Okay. One of the more interesting things about pregnancy, which I found fascinating, is that during the course of a pregnancy. It has been noticed and noted that relapse rates go down substantially, which makes sense. Think about it. So you have your native immune system. It is designed to remove or attack anything that is foreign. 
That's how if you get infected with something, your immune system recognizes that infection, if you will, then figures out how to eradicate it and remove it. And it does a substantially good job of, of taking care of that business, if you will. So think about it from this perspective too, that that embryo, that, that small person growing inside of you, that individual is part you, but part him. Okay. And so therefore there's the two halves and from a genetic point of view to a different individual, unique, but from an immune point of view, a foreign body. And yet in most cases, there's no attack because the woman's immune system, I'm going to use a fancy word from my perspective, down regulates, if you will, alters itself to the point that it allows this unique circumstance to occur and go from point A development to birth. And so in changing that recognition signaling, what it then does is, hmm, potentially, those same white blood cells that normally would have been attacking your insulation on your nerves loses that sensitivity thinking, hmm, maybe it's not firing. So as a result, I think that is one of the major reasons as to why during the course of a pregnancy, there is a reduction in MS exacerbations. And granted, for some patients, it doesn't work out that way. They have just as many during uh, pregnancy, but they are more rare or uncommon, if you will, than common. The majority of women do quite well at that point in time. But then comes postpartum. You delivered that little person. And then for most, for many, in that within that, comes out of that first 90 days, there's a significant increase in um, the chances for MS exacerbation, therefore the so-called relapse. And there have been no great methodologies to correct or fix that. What some will do, they will forego breastfeeding and restart their medications pretty immediately. What others will do is get high those steroids at that point in time, what some will do is use a methodology termed IVIG, as well as the treatment uh, protocol that people will use. So multiple things have been done um, to try to, if you will, stay off that relapse, which of course, as you might imagine, uh, you just had a brand new little person um, and you're now having sort of, at least temporarily, your worst concern was that you won't be able to do what you want to do with your little person. And so as a result, that's why I think potentially people will have major concerns about pregnancy and particularly uh, postpartum, uh, which has to happen at some point in time as well. And typically it lasts about 90 days. It can go up to six months for some, maybe a little longer, but usually a uh, six months would capture that window uh, of potential increased risk for most people at this point in time. When it comes to the disease modifying therapies, we term here the DMTs. And what, what that really means is your clotrimine acetate, your, uh, you know, your beta interferon 1A or 1B, your natalizumab, notice Tysabri, your Vimerides, your, your Tequideros, Gelinias, and so forth. They're all a DMT, if you will, as a global term. Um, and the key thing to remember, even though it is commonplace that the glutirma acetate is offered in women who have childbearing potential, who uh, are not necessarily going to uh, use birth control or techniques that will prevent them or reduce their risk of getting pregnant um, uh, at any given time. That is the, the sort of a go-to medication for that group, and primarily because years ago when they were using the categories uh, A, B, and, and so and so on, um, is that category B meant safe in pregnancy, and the clotrimine acetate met that criteria many years ago, and so therefore it was used in that time, and for people who would breastfeed, it was thought to be safe there as well. Um, but as you see here, no disease modifying therapy has actually been FDA approved for pregnancy, but that became a standard, if you will, in the industry to offer. 
Um, and so it looks like in retrospect, looking at other data sets, that the interferons as well may be as safe or reasonably as safe as well, even though when you look at the beta seron version, interferon uh, 1b, that there may be a slight increase in the miscarriage aspect uh, compared to the other interferon. Once again, this is retrospective data, as you might imagine, because no one has actually necessarily entered um, a large pregnancy study. These are from registries. Oh, and I also need to mention to you as well, these slides were developed from the National MS Society's website primarily. There's some things in here that were added um, that's not there, but the majority of the data here, information here, is from the website. So if you want more information, about the slide set that we have here this evening. Please, please, please um, connect to the National MS Society uh, website and you can get that data, get that information. When you look at the other disease modifying therapies, the tecfidaridimethyl fumarate um, is thought to be potentially safe. Once again, it's not FDA approved, it's not been formally studied uh, in terms of study design, but probably registry didn't see any substantial uh, issues with it. And you wouldn't would, would anticipate that potentially uh, its cousin, as I call it, Fumarity, would have similar ben benefits as well. But once again, this is speculatory at this juncture, but we see nothing to suggest that that's different than that. The um, last bullet point in that prior slide talked about the S1P uh, gelinia. And per this slide, it suggested that sort of globally, this particular class of medication needed to be um, discontinued prior to pregnancy for about two months for, for the washout period. We would come across some other data that talks about the COVID and infection um, as well, but for pregnancy, that has been one of the recommendations, once again, um, you would speak with your primary neurologist and specialist and potentially even your OBGYN as well to get their final approval or uh, sort of assessment when using any medications of this type. And then, and then the because Gelinia was one of the first, if you will, um, medications for uh, multiple sclerosis as an oral, it is considered sort of the global medicine. And, and, and since then, they've actually developed uh, more focal or targeting, if you will, um, what, what are termed S1P medications. And, and Parvori is one of those. And potentially, at least early data, the, the, the number of people that have been looked at is not particularly large, but suggesting that potentially where it may have been a major concern um, here, maybe it may not be less so. So once again, there's still data to be collected, information to be identified for us to determine fully what some of these medications may do. We don't know exactly for all of them, but once again, we get to that point. And then we get into the infusible uh, medications, you're sometimes termed alemtuzumab, when try to your okalizumab or rituximab, these medications, um, because they are classified globally as monoclonal antibodies. Okay, what's important about that is that means that they are IgG-like. During a time when a person has had an MS exacerbation and they are in fact pregnant, what does one do? What can one uh, make a difference in in that setting? And what is often considered is the steroids, given the steroids, because typically if you were not pregnant and you were not breastfeeding, then if you had an MS attack, the standard of care has historically been to take a steroid infusion, typically a thousand milligrams of uh, an IV steroid, typically the term used, um, solumedrol. Um, and for some of you who may be allergic or have reactions to the steroids, you may in fact get this thing, procedure called IVIG, or you may actually get something called panophoresis where your blood is sort of filtered and then put back. Um, and then some of you get the, this thing called ACTH or ACTAR gel, which is another uh, medical management. However, uh, during pregnancy, um, the, the ACTAR or ACTH is not considered safe. 
uh, phoresis and the IVIG is not typically done in that setting as well because it may not be ideal for the pregnancy. Um, and then often the GYN or OBGYN were frowned upon steroids being given as well, unless it is a dire emergent circumstance, which is not usually the case with a uh, MS patient. And because the MS itself doesn't directly affect the pregnancy, because as a general rule, you are having multiple sclerosis, your risk of any kind of complication in pregnancy is no different than a young lady who does not have multiple sclerosis. It's not different. It's the same, to be honest with you. Your immune system is similar to theirs. You just have some aspects of it that are attacking a given location. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, in most cases, your MS becomes quiescent during pregnancy. So therefore, it's a general rule, not a major deal. But once again, things to be concerned about to look at when one uh, is considering uh, pregnancy um, and risk benefit is there, there as well. When it comes to the delivery, there's of course natural, there is then um, the use of the C-section and, and then potentially other procedures that are often done, epidurals to mitigate some of the discomfort associated with the delivery. And as a general rule, you know, all of these things can be done um, because once again, as I mentioned to you earlier, your general risk for adverse events is not dissimilar to any other young lady who happens not to have MS and just going through uh, a, a routine or regular pregnancy. And so all the procedures are open to you uh, to use as well. Moving forward. Now, let's get into this. This is actually, this is why I do these presentations because I discover things, things that I, may have thought of uh, in the contrary. So there's a number of sort of papers out there looking at breastfeeding. And once again, this is not a new idea, right, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, there's tons of papers out there always have been. However, there's some in particular about uh, multiple sclerosis and, and pregnancy. And what we're finding is that it seems that breastfeeding is protective. For example, remember when we were discussing the uh, potential reason why people are having or women are having fewer children and the concern was potentially relapse during that postpartum first 90 days, first six months? Well, it turns out that if that young lady breastfeeds, it seems to reduce the tendency to have that MS relapse postpartum. Interesting enough, who knew? Um, I'm sure a lot of you knew this, uh, which is quite intriguing to say at least. So I'm personally um, now going to start asking my patients that have had issues occur during their um, postpartum state and say, did you breastfeed? Because I don't know the answer to that question right offhand. I haven't routinely documented that, but we will start documenting it. So it's quite interesting to see that reality that seems to make a positive outcome on the patient. And of course, there's tons of data that suggests it also has a positive outcome on the child as well. So something to consider for those of you who are looking at potentially expanding your families, um, just keep in mind that breastfeeding may be an ideal situation to consider as well as part of that um, uh, equation, if you will. And of course, I mentioned to you guys earlier, earlier the clotrimine acetate or copaxone um, is also considered safe during the course of pregnancy, um, even though um, it's not FDA approved for that, but that's sort of a standard that's been in the industry for, for many, many years now. Moving forward. Okay, the medications. So what you see listed here are from the National Medicine Society websites I mentioned to you guys earlier. And they have addressed Avernax, Betacyrine, Rebif, and some, and some added detail. Abajo is also there. But some of the other medications, they're still collecting data. So we don't really know uh, fully what uh, the ramifications for them are when it comes to pregnancy and then outcome. There are some, a lot of anecdotal studies out there, small studies out there, uh, but not large enough yet to uh, publish at least uh, under site and then validate accordingly. But they did uh, had opportunity to put in there 
the interferons, 1A, which is Avonex, um, and then the beta serine, which is um, interferons 1B. And then, of course, Rebif is also a 1A. And, and if you may notice, its numbers, internal spontaneous abortions, um, kids that are normal, is very close or very similar to that of Avonex, which it, which it, should, it should be, given that they are just essentially a very similar molecule. The interferon 1A, which is um, it's those, but interferon 1B, which is beta serine, is a little bit different how they uh, sort of publish the data. Uh, so therefore, I've written it different here. But the spontaneous abortions portion, whether it be the, um, the interferon 1A or 1B, is very, very similar. Um, as you may notice here, the primary difference is that for the 1B, which is beta serine, um, they saw that there were more uh, birth defects noticed compared to the other medications. But keep in mind, too, when I mentioned the spontaneous abortions, well, the rate that they have at 11.5 or 11.1, that's still within the range of what happens in people who don't have multiple sclerosis, who are not on, therefore, a disease modifying therapy, like as these are, because the normal rate is 10 to 20 percent. So it's still within that range, which means that it may not be necessarily directly related to the medication, but just a, a happenstance for those patients who happen to be on a particular medication. Once again, things to keep in mind as you're considering uh, your medicine, but also considering sort of outcomes uh, for any patient that you're, or, or, or any patient that you know about as a physician, but also for friends and family as you're looking at and talking about pregnancy as a whole. And we don't really have a lot of data, uh, any data on the, the Lemtrada or the Jelena or Ocalizumab, sometimes called Oprevus, to actually recount anything significant. And we do have information on the Natalizumab, you know that as Tysabri, and it also gives us similar numbers to what we saw earlier for the interferons. Uh, in that the uh, spontaneous abortion rate fell within the usual limits, um, and it also has reported some birth defects that also falls in the range of um, usual, if you will, for an individual who happens not to have uh, MS at all or on these medications accordingly. So once again, not to say that they're safe, but they seem not to make a, a dr dramatic negative impact on the outcome of your children or uh, spontaneous abortions like that. Let's change pace just a little. So what I have here, ladies and gentlemen, is a photograph of the bad guy. We call this person COVID-19 or into the COVID-19. Um, and I think the most recent version is Omicron and there's probably gonna be another version, another version, another version. I think it's going to become a, a, a part of our vernacular, um, uh, like flu, um, unfortunately. But nevertheless, there have been numerous updates. In fact, I think my slides are reduced um, too early uh, because there's updates since these updates were here. But nevertheless, the general consensus when it comes to a multiple sclerosis patient who is on a disease modifying therapy, that he or she should be vaccinated and I guess at this point boosted. Uh, and that's been the general consensus of the National Human Society uh, since onset. Once they were, had enough data to confirm outcomes, enough data to look at uh, patients, the medications um, and the virus itself. And they have a group of people that look at this on an ongoing basis, and that's still the consensus, to be honest with you. They also suggested at the time uh, Pfizer's version or Moderna's version, and I think at one point also including uh, J&J's version as well, uh, for vaccination um, and then the boosting uh, for them as well. And of course, as you guys are all aware of, at this point in time, if even if you did Pfizer as your initial vaccination, you now are permitted to switch to Moderna um, if one chooses. Once again, you can switch from one to the other. I think most probably have not done that, but once again, there is a reason potentially that you may want to do that because of the access or position that you're in. Once again, moving forward. 
So what we have here, ladies and gentlemen, is a number of graphs. I'm not going to go through those graphs for you, but I provided them because I think you're able to download this and you can study the slides, but a number of graphs. And in these graphs, what you will see is a breakdown of these particular dynamics of a given individual. You see ethnicity, you see, you see gender, you see if they, they had what are called comorbidities, other medical disorders that may have contributed to uh, an adverse event when it comes to COVID-19, like, like death, for example, or significant prolonged hospitalization. And you'll see that. And what they also noted is that individuals that had decreased mobility, individuals that were on the older side, individuals that were African-American, um, males as a general rule, and then um, people who had significant high blood pressure, um, people who had coexisting cardiovascular disease. Once again, what they found is that all of these are risk factors, and of course, these are independent of them having multiple sclerosis. The multiple sclerosis by itself does not seem to increase your mortality. What tends to increase your mortality if you are immune suppressed, once again, it's a medication treating your MS, okay? And then if you also, on top of that, had one of those things mentioned, high blood pressure, heart disease, obesity, male gender, uh, and so on and so on, older age and so forth. Once again, these are the dynamics that one needs to be aware of to attest to one's risk. And hopefully, if you happen not to be vaccinated, see that uh, it is reasonable to you to do so if those things apply to you. And granted, the vaccination is not perfect. People still get COVID. Ideally, what tends to happen, however, instead of uh, mortality as in passing away, they tend to potentially get simply sick and then have a good, um, complete or reasonably complete recovery uh, more often than not once they're vaccinated. And I think that's the key thing to keep in mind, moving the pendulum, if you will, from death as a more often seen item to merely just some illness, limited disability, if any. Once again, that's the idea, that's the movement. Moving forward. And once again, this is more information with, with the same thing. And you see, therefore, this is, these slides are focused primarily, as it should be, on the United States, as that's where we are presently. And it also goes through the different disease modifying therapies and what outcomes were seen there for uh, patients who were exposed to the COVID-19 virus, which I thought was quite interesting. And once again, we, could, we had the time, go through that and you'll be sort of impressed at how some that you thought made a, might have made a negative impact really seemingly has not at the time that this data was collected. So once again, things to look at and, and consider uh, when it comes to vaccination or not. Moving forward. Once again, these slides all sort of are giving you the same information. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is this. In as much as multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disorder, it in of itself does not create an immunosuppressed state. The medications that you use to treat your multiple sclerosis often can create an immunosuppressed state. For example, if you were on the medication known as oculizumab or the medication known as, I don't know, um, Delinia, these medications can suppress your immune system such that you did in fact choose to get vaccinated. You get your first shot, you waited the appropriate amount of time, got your second shot, waited the appropriate amount of time, checked your immune response, your titer, and you say you got 90%. You then started taking your immune modulating medication, sometimes you know, term DMT, disease modifying therapy, got remeasured and you notice that, hmm, it was at 90%, now it's at 40%, now it's at 38%, now it's at 
that kind of thing, okay? So some of the immune suppressed medications, because of their mechanism, how they work, how they target your immune system, can also remove certain memory cells, if you will, that remember the vaccination that you that you received or an infection from COVID, infection that you, so where, where sort of unfortunately uh, got as well, it can reduce your immune response. So therefore, if someone becomes into your presence and you're exposed again, you're more likely than not will get sick again. Now, if you got a 40% or 50% response there, not the 90% granted, where 90% the hope would be that you would not get sick at all if, if or very limited degree, while at 40%, you actually may get sicker, but hopefully you still would not necessarily have a fatal outcome, but you may get sicker than you would if you were on a medication that didn't reduce the efficacy. So typically what then is suggested, depending on what medication you're taking, is to sort of stage when you get your inoculations and stage when you get your infusions. And for some, that has been effective in reducing the reduction of their immune response to their vaccination. For others, it hasn't worked out that well at all, in which case one need then has to consider um, using a medication that is not known to have a dramatic impact on reducing your overall response. And some of them, for example, you look at tumor acetate is not thought to have a major role there. Your interferons is thought not to have a major role there as well. Some of the sol selective S1Ps may not have dramatic of a role there as well. So, uh, your fumarates, your tecfidaris, your vumarides, those two are not thought to have a major role there in reducing your your, your sort of immune response um, as well. Once again, some of them are thought to be more dramatic. For example, those that are termed B cell depleters, and that would include your oculizumab, uh, your lemtratas, um, and a couple of others that are B cell depleters, and they're thought to have a more dramatic role in reduce the efficacy of your vaccination benefit. So once again, things to consider. Um, but on the other hand, depending on your, your MS and how you respond to the medication, you may need those medicines. They're working for you. They're doing a superb job for you. You just have to be aware of the fact that you may need to wear a mask when others are not, or um, make sure that your significant others and friends and those who come visit are in fact uh, vaccinated, and but also wearing the mask when they need to, to protect you from harm. And for a lot of you, this is not new, but prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of you protected yourselves on your own already in advance so because you knew that you were immune suppressed. So a lot of these behaviors that you're going through aren't unique, aren't new, and aren't necessarily un unexpected. So once again, things to consider, things to um, talk about uh, within your, your friends and your, your significant circle um, that you may have moving forward. And on and this side, this talks about the booster. The data in here is no longer fully accurate. I think uh, it's no longer 18, 18 and older. That's changed um since uh, a couple of weeks ago as well uh, moving forward right so um so, so the immune response in and of itself is thought to be reduced by those medications that are titled um s1p modulators and you see a list here. you see gelinia mazin zaposia and ponvori i would tell you that i've been uh, sort of presented with more recent data, in particular for Ponvori, and would say to you that um, even though they've been grouped here uh, together with um, Jelenia, it, that's not necessarily as fully accurate. So once again, uh, speak with your uh, primary neurologist and MS specialist and get a view from them um, because sometimes the packaging grouping together is not fully accurate. The time they created this, it might have been, but in the end from, we now have updates and new data and not necessarily uh, true any longer. And then for the um, monoclonal antibodies that are B-cell depleters, and you see those here with the oculizumab, uh, the rituximab, and what they call biosimilars and consimpta. Um, and their data still seems to hold 
um, that they are significant uh, impact um, in terms of reducing the efficacy of your vaccination. So once again, keep that in mind as you go through and make your decision on one, being on disease modifying therapy, number two, which one you're going to take, and then what precautions you need to consider as well. Moving forward. And then this slide just talks about evidence out there, what, what you're looking at, what you're considering. Um, and there's some aspects on this particular slide that are a little bit contrary to what you reviewed earlier. Once again, the point being is that there's still data to be captured, data to be to be synthesized, and then with the information then coming out to us as healthcare providers and you as recipients of that healthcare. Um, and so where one place may say that it is a negative impact, another place, well, we're not sure that that's true or we're, we feel contrary to that. So this slide sort of brings out some of those aspects. But once again, just try to do the best you can. It's all you can in decision making and speak to all the right people um, and then come to a conclusion what works best for you. Ladies and gentlemen, we now have medications out there that you can be given when you have been exposed to someone that has tested positive but you don't necessarily have symptoms as of yet and this ever you shed uh, mentioned here on this slide is that medication there were already medications out there that if you were exposed and had symptoms, that's been out there for a long time. Everyone's aware of those. But we now have one um, out there wherein you were exposed to a person who tested positive, but you have no symptoms. This ever is the medication for you to consider. So we're really, I think, moving forward with some really fancy uh, techniques, fancy medications out there to help us live as full of a healthy existence as possible. And I am really just impressed with the technology, the skill set of so many of these scientists that have come forward and really made a difference. Fascinating. Yeah, I will tell you that, unfortunately, you're all going to run into the healthcare provider who is not as versed on some of these treatment consideration because, as I mentioned to you before, there are well over 20 medications just for MS alone. We're not talking about this Evershed and these other sort of, uh, sort of high-tech movements otherwise that a number may not just be fully aware of. What can you do? Well, as I mentioned to you earlier, this information has come from the National MS Society website, so it's there. And they also have a list of healthcare providers that are specialists, and that may be to assist you in identifying individuals that may be more versed, or if your healthcare provider is up to the task, bring things before them. And so a lot of us will, will read what you have and, and synthesize that and, and analyze what you have, and then if it makes good sense, institute that medication regimen. Once again, uh, most of us are aware of uh, the fact that sometimes something comes out new that we have not been made aware of. We, we missed it. It's been out about 10 days. I mean, for a while there, there was a new MS medication coming out seemingly once every month. Um, so it happens, granted, but once again, um, there, there are ways of um, using the next technology that we now have on the internet to identify individuals that are experts or uh, well-informed, but the National Human Society website is a great reasonable um, source because there you're not looking at secondary gain or other motivations, you're looking at a source that validates what they print and publish. Moving forward. Okay, so that's that's the last slide, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I apologize. It looks like I went way long. I promised uh, our, our host that I would uh, do this for 35 minutes, and um, he let me continue to talk. I'm sorry, young man. And like I told you, you take as long as you need to because you have a tremendous amount of information to give, and I have to allow you the time to speak. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. So, firstly, I want to give you. A kudos, great, great response. I mean, great conversation you had there. I'm hoping that people will uh, have questions to ask. I didn't see many coming in yet, but
but I did be able, I, I have been able to uh, fuel questions prior to the uh, program tonight from others. And before we even get into that, though, I again want to thank our sponsors of Biogen and Genentech. And hopefully down the line, we'll have, you know, more and more sponsors to be able to call out to you as well to, in support of our programs. All right. So first, um, we have people asking about, you hit on a subject on COVID severity. And one of the people was asking about, you know, the long haul effects and a person having shortness of breath and how long can she expect to have shortness of breath and that um, uh, I shouldn't explain how it is, but she just said she has shortness of breath. Certainly. So unfortunately, young lady, um, a number of the symptoms. So MS in and of itself as a disorder does not give you shortness of breath as a disorder. It does not happen. In fact, MS as a disorder does not necessarily, does not kill you per se, okay? What it can do is create immobility where you now lay on your backside or immobilized enough that you develop bed sores and other things that create medical concerns that can be fatal. But to your question is, there are individuals unfortunately that have prolonged respiratory consequences from their COVID infection and it did not resolve. That we're all aware of. What I cannot tell you, because I'm not a pulmonologist, is in your particular situation, did you one have the, the bilateral pneumonias? Did you have the pulmonary emboli? All these little parts of the, of, of the equation dictate to some degree what your outcome might be. Hopefully, you have a pulmonologist or a great internist working with you, and he or she is going to actually do the pulmonary function test, which is necessary to give you a sense of where you are, particularly where you're going. Plus, time is critical. Um, in as much as an individual would love to have a situation where in, I was sick last week, this week I'm great. Well, when it comes to the pulmonary components, particularly if they persist, that tends to go for weeks to months, um, usually with the person getting better as they go. But also keep in mind, you may need to exercise and you may need to push yourself. But do this, of course, with a proper instruction from your particular health care provider uh, to make sure that it's safe. Okay, thank you for that. Bouncing around, we're going to go back and forth as the questions right. come in. A person writes, what is the likelihood of passing a mess on to children if a mother of one partner and a father of another conceive and have a baby. So the chance of, of having a child with MS, a mother of one partner and a father of another partner, but the two partners that are together don't have MS. Is that what you're saying? I'm gonna read it to you again. My brain is not interpreting this correctly either. What is the likelihood of passing MS on to children if a mother of one partner and a father of another partner conceive and have a baby? Okay, so I think I understand so this now. So, they, so I got you. So, so, so they are first degree relatives. All right. So, so it isn't. So if it's one partner, then it is. Um, if, and, and if it's female, then it is three to four percent. If it's male, it is two to three percent. If from both sides, it is closer to five to six percent. Is that the final answer? Yes. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. I didn't know if you were just thinking or you wanted to continue. So, um, all right, great. Thank you for that. All right, next. I guess it's the same person. And is conceiving a child more difficult for a woman with multiple sclerosis? So the literature says the answer being that I'm a guy. I've never delivered anything other than the mail once or twice. Um, they say that the answer is no, that your risk for complications, side effects, difficulty is not different. Now, keep that in mind. This is assuming that your MS is not affecting necessarily the lower part of your body. I mean, there's different, that question can be answered in so many different ways based on the individual's uh, uh, involvement of the MS, because if they're wheelchair bound, then there is an effect in a sense, right? Because that person is likely going to be delivered 
by maybe cesarean or by procedure because they may not be able to push when it's time to push. On the other hand, if that person is uh, of ambulatory with no obvious usual symptoms most of the time, that individual will probably deliver like any young lady uh, via epidural being done to reduce the discomfort and otherwise be the usual self. Okay, thank you for that. Um, in answer to one of your fans, Anne Marie wants to thank you, Dr. Walker. It was great hearing you. And to Bruce, as usual with all of our events, this is being video recorded or has been video recorded and will be up on our YouTube channel in just a couple of days. So you'll be able to review all the slides on there and share it out with everybody that you know, okay? So uh, thank you for asking. All right, going back to this first person asking about all these pregnancy questions, what is the most current advice for women who are considering pregnancy, pregnancy in terms of vaccines and boosters? Oh, I see. Okay, so there is tons of debate, right, on that subject in and of itself. The ultimate answer has always been that when in doubt, get vaccinated. That's been that's been the thought. The general consensus is that does not seem to be a negative impact on the fetus, on that little person that's growing inside of you. So the general teaching has been to get vaccinated. Um, but once again, you will have to talk to your expert and your expert is your OBGYN um, because they're the experts in pregnancy in and of itself and see what his or her consensus is in that regard. But the general consensus from, a, from an MS physician's point of view is that being pregnant doesn't preclude you from getting vaccinated. Okay, thank you. Going over to Eva Shelves. Um, are there any negative impacts by using Eva Shelves? That's the first part. It, it is so, right now, it's so new. Um, I don't know that they, I think the general consensus report saying is saying there isn't, but I don't know that we know that, to be honest with you. It's so new. It, it was, I think, FDA approved in late December of 21. And so, and then wasn't available for use until the middle or end of, of January of 22. Um, and so we've had a good, strong month to actually have patients that have used it. Thus far, I've not personally seen a problem, um, but it's way too early to tell at this juncture. Okay, and is Evasheld available just by blinking your eyes? I mean, how do you get it? So basically, it will require you to contact your healthcare provider, ideally. He or she will know that, for example, where I am in Charleston, the American University of South Carolina has this medication available. So my patient would contact me and say, hey, I was exposed. I then would contact the proper individual at the university, and then they will get infused with the medication. Your doctor should be to do the exact same thing. And it should be, they did create a registry, and there is a rollout, and I believe it's, it's in most states, most locations. Right, so what we had heard, and I'll just throw that out there as well, is that um, percentage-wise, it was given to each state and into each area. So obviously the more urban of an area that you might live in, the less likelihood you'll find it compared to if you had a doctor and you were living on the outside. Agreed. Agreed. All right, and then uh, another question with Evasheld is, um, can this be used with any of the B cell, any of the people that are using any B cell depleter, or are there other medications similar to Evashel that can be used for another B cell depleter? So, as far as I can, as far as I'm aware of, your DNT doesn't necessarily preclude you from using this medication. Um, and so, and we've had people actually on uh, B cell depleters and getting Evershed and have not had an issue. So thus far, it seems to be independent of your disease modifying therapy. Okay, thank you. All right, skipping back to another topic. Christine writes, "Thank you for chatting tonight, both you gentlemen. Well, thank you, Christine. Uh, why typically women have major relapses postpartum? I personally did at five weeks and at eight post months post." Love the bow tie. Well, that's not me, so we know who she's talking about. Thank you. <laughs> and so the question was why the relapses? Why typically women have more relapses postpartum? Oh, okay, okay. So here's the idea. 
we mentioned earlier how your immune system seems to trim back, if you will, trim back, reduce its sensitivity to, in this case, the little person that you're carrying, which in essence is a foreign body. It trims back. Once you are postpartum, your immune system wakes up and wants to return to its original um, immune sensitive level. And you might imagine it might overshoot in that process. As a result, you have increase in the immune response activity and what it attacked previously is more aggressive with. That's the idea. As a result of that, you're more likely to have an MS exacerbation in that postpartum period because of the, in my mind, over awakening, if you will. So isn't this similar then to, they say that when a woman gets pregnant, she's least likely to have an exacerbation. Correct. So, so therefore, what you're saying is like during the downtime, so the the tide is here, and then it's you know it's being held down while pregnant, but as soon as you give birth, it just erupts. Correct. Okay. Right. All right. Gotcha. Gotcha. And and right. and, if, and if you think about it, Stuart, um, in some sense, that's probably intentional by design to make that young lady more safe right. from any external infection to then protect her child. Exactly. Sounds that way. Yeah. Sounds that way. We should write a book on that. <laughs> okay. Next question, going back to COVID. All right. Um, the shortness of breath we discussed, you said about the pulmonary function test. Cognition, for those that are having uh, word recall problems. I, I I told you that I'm having this issue. I know many other people that had COVID that are having the same issue. Is there a lessening to this? Is it will I will we and I will they and I get back to a normal, or is this going to continue? So answer the question in terms of the um, sometimes described as mental fogging, if you will. Uh, it tends to resolve. Yes, I have not been aware of a patient where it persisted beyond the 90 days six month period but it could and unfortunately because we now know that there are patients with the pulmonary aspects of it that that are for life it's potential but the difference being is that in the pulmonary aspect of it that person may have had the pneumonia with the thrombosis as their issue, while the cognitive thing is more of an electrical process, probably, in which case then that should uh, resolve on its own. And then keep in mind is that 10% of patients with multiple sclerosis will present as cognitive issues as their initial problem. For that patient, it might be a slower process, but for those who were cognitively intact in advance of, I suspect that they should recover. I suspect that within 90 days to six months, they should be back to their original baseline. Okay, got it. Thank you. And again, for all of our attendees that are watching tonight, if you have any questions, please remember, type them in because I can't ask what you want to ask unless you let me know what it is you want to ask. How's that? Uh, pretty good memory on that one. All right. Um, <clears throat> the headaches. Um, people are complaining about these headaches that they can't get rid of. And again, this is from their COVID. And um, is there any relief for them other than a pack of ice? I wish that I could give you a wonderful, beautiful answer to that question. So what well, you may not know, I'm also a, a headache specialist. And the patients with this headache, first of all, will tell you, it is not like my migraines. It is not like my cluster headache. It's not like any headache I've ever had before. First of all, that's, that's the bottom line always, but you already have a headache. It is different. It is tied directly to the COVID-19 infestation and radiographically MRI, apparently to date, they see nothing on MRI that suggests that it's present. And thus far, as far as I can ascertain, most people, close to all people that has had this occur, has had this headache over time get better and better and resolve uh, within the three month, four month, five month window. And it gets better each and every time. That's good, that's good. 
All right, so now on to something a little bit different concerning COVID, mask wearing. So some people complain that, you know, they can't breathe with the mask on. Okay, I could understand that. I guess if you can't breathe with it on, you got a damn good mask, right? So, um, but how is the fabric of the mask, being that most of them are coming from China, okay? Is that fabric really safe for us to be inhaling? <laughs> good question. Once again, this is an assumption on my part. My assumption is that the materials which they're made of is sterilized and then maintain sterility with, within reason and then ship accordingly. Um, I had not considered uh, that aspect of it, uh, location of production and then, and then infestation. But uh, by my assumption is that that's sterilized and, and it should not be an issue. I would suspect, to be honest with you, that um, probably they're not spreading, they're not spreaders, the, the mask itself. No, they're giving you something else instead, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Potentially. All right. So also another question concerning masks is how long is wearing a mask too long? I mean, people are wearing these K95s. And they may have only had one since over a year ago. And is it still safe for them to be wearing it? Is it still effective? Oh, I see. So, no. So the mask itself, once it once it shows signs of being soiled, uh, you need to change your mask out uh, because you're breathing in germs and and uh, grant your own granite, but nevertheless, the, the mask is soiled. Um, and apparently, once once it gets wet enough on the, on the exterior, it is, is no longer as effective as it once was as well. And then, depending, depending on what it's getting soiled with, it actually may end up being more difficult to breathe through this thing um, as well. So, so, you, so you need to change them out. Um, and different different uh, people have reported different data, um, and I've seen people suggest that you shouldn't wear them more than three to four times, uh, or three to four days, if, if you wear them a day at a time. That's, that's, that's um, coincidental to something I did this weekend. We had an event in Greenville, South Carolina, and it was like um, every half hour to 45 minutes, I was changing out my mask because I was running around so much, I was perspiring, and I just said, I don't want to keep breathing the same crap that I'm exhaling, you know? So I kept changing out my mask, which just threw off the audience because I went from black to purple to green to something else, and it was fun. Okay, next question is from Stephanie, and she asks, do you have an opinion about CES, cranial electrical stimulation? Hmm. There is limited, very limited evidence that it will have a positive impact for what they're suggesting. Uh, the idea, fascinating. I don't know that we will ever know, um, but um, that's it's, it's a hopeful idea. Um, so I'm, I'm reading background data trying to determine that. So we'll see. But right now, I don't know that it can do what is claimed. Okay, thank you. What about the TMS for people with depression? Now, TMS is a bit different because that's a technique that's been touted and used for, my goodness, a, a easily 20, almost 30 years, if not longer. Um, and there's a great deal, a large body of supportive data that uh, confirm within reason that it actually does work. Um, it requires a person to use it, uh, I think, pretty frequently. You need uh, um, what I call do-overs, boosters um, from from that therapy. It's not, it's not forever, if you will, but uh, I've heard uh, and read good things about it. So I think it is uh, an asset to a number of people. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. So going on to something a little bit more um, complimentary, I guess you could call it. I really don't know what you would call it, but some people have told me that they've been using hyperbaric chambers and that this is working for them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think they became infamous or famous with Michael Jackson because he because he is what he used to recover from. Um, there's not a lot of data um, or large body of data or beyond cohort stuff and small package 
stuff with um, MS and, and hyperbaric chambers. Um, one has to be careful, make sure that the person that uh, has set it up for you and that you're using it safely because you can get permanent injury from it. Um, once again, this is uh, the idea that you're concentrating oxygen among other things. And um, the idea seems to make people um, maybe feel better. And maybe it does. It may reduce some of the fatigue and potentially. Um, there's not a large part of data on this uh, in of itself, but we've heard uh, good things. We've also heard some of the negatives as well. I'm not sure I would go out and purchase one and put it in my living room. Um, at this juncture, I don't think data is that strong yet, but it is something as a consideration. We, we actually have one at the university. I don't know that we've used it yet for this particular uh, disorder MS, but once again, uh, thank you for mentioning it, and I'll consider it. Okay, so with your uh, mechanical background, though, you can put that in your bedroom or in your living room, and you can put on the thing to make it buck up and down, and you can make it a rodeo type of unit as well. Okay. Interesting. Right. Yes. Before I go on to a couple other questions, I just want to let people know that on this coming Saturday, uh, March 5th, we're doing a program in Columbus, Ohio, and it's with uh, it's about the MS immune system, and it's with uh, Megan Weigel will be there speaking about holistic therapies for the immune system, and then we will have Aaron Boster and Ben Thrower doing a little sparring match to talk about MS. One is going to play multiple sclerosis. The other is going to play a doctor. And the multiple sclerosis is going to attack the immune system. And the doctor is going to talk about what he's going to do to make you feel better. So this is going to be a great program. It was something that I designed and uh, we thought about last year and said that this would be a great thing to do during March Awareness Month and do it totally different. So uh, it'll, it'll be a nice thing to watch and, and see what these two do with it. Then on um, March 15th, we have a neuro-ophthalmologist that will be on speaking about visual issues and multiple sclerosis. On May, on May, listen to me, on March 26th, I'll be in Memphis, Tennessee with Dr. Samuel Hunter, and we'll be doing a Compass to Care program, Rural America. And, I, and this is also, it's hybrid, so you'll be able to watch it online. And then on March 31st, it will be me, Damian Washington, and Tyler Campbell, and it'll be three men with MS talking about MS, and we'll talk about all the good things that we found out about March Awareness Month and all the good things that we saw or took part with, you know, during the month that we could share back with the community. So, um, you know, I just wanted to thank you all for that. Now, getting back to some of the remaining questions, is going back to the, um, I don't know if you brought it up at all, but the BTK inhibitors, that's a question. And, uh, People are asking, when is it going to come about? When is the first one to be FDA approved? And how beneficial is it over current medications? So the, so the, BT, uh, the, the BTK inhibitors, that is uh, making the, the headlines, if you will, at least in the MS arena. I honestly thought that they were going to be released um, sooner already. I, I, the, the last time I read their reviews, I'm looking at uh, June, July, August is what I saw, but there were suggestions that it would be sooner than that. It hadn't happened yet. Um, they are a different approach um, than what we've done traditionally at this point in time. The At least the early data, it's very strong that they may be successful. Uh, and the um, side effects, if you will, of our existing medications aren't necessarily issues with them. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleasantly hopeful that they were revolutionized. We've had uh, hopes like this before, and then things come up and the, the side effect problem becomes a problem. But thus far, I see no suggestions of that happening. And uh, it'd be wonderful to have close to 30 medicines. I think that about six of these guys, uh, that just should be coming. And, and with that, that will give us opportunity and, and variety. Once again, another part of the armamentarium, which is particularly important because so many of you guys are so unique that traveling one path is not the answer. Traveling multiple paths is where we need to be. And, 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 and the, this group of medications is gonna give us that. Okay, thank you for that. And the last question concerns myelin 
and what is happening in Mylan Repair? So Mylan Repair has, my goodness, has been a work effort that dates back at least 50 or more years, at the beginning of time, if you will, once they realized that Mylan uh, being damaged and lost was the was what was happening or the problem, if you will, so then they figured out how to reverse that. And they've been working on it. They have not come up with a one safe um, and sort of administratable, if you will, if that's even a word, uh, methodology to actually make it happen. Um, and, and this is, and you know, this is sort of the, the crux, if you will, of the whole um, fetal uh, embryo techniques uh, tied to that whole remyelination idea of, of, of placing new cells into a system and repopulating and then getting rid of the, of the bad guys in, in that process and then putting in the system where now the cell type called the oligodendrocytes then begin to remyelinate and do their job as one would expect them to and protecting you. But keep this in mind, ladies and gentlemen, is that when you're looking at remyelination techniques and you have a significant deficit and per your neuroimaging you have words like significant tissue loss atrophy is another word for that if i were to remyelinate you tomorrow all that means is that you should not get any worse but you will not necessarily get better okay because as it stands right now, we don't regrow neurons, brain tissue. You're born with a ton of it, and over time, it atrophies, it dies, it goes away. And because we have so much of it, and because in theory, they say when you lose about 10% of it, then you have all this extra. And as time progresses, you're using a larger 10% because what you have is, is smaller. So what you need really, not just remyelination, you need regrowth, regrowth, replacement of the neuro tissue. And then on top of that, now cover it with insulation. And now not only have you stopped progression of disease, but you've also created a circumstance of recovery. For that individual that has very minimal symptoms, he or she may do just fine with a situation where they just got remyelinated, they'll never be any worse, they're fine. But for that individual who has substantial, significant uh, impairment from the multiple sclerosis, they're likely going to need more than just remyelination. They need right remyelination and they're going to need regrowth. That's incredible. We never had anybody explain it like that before. So that was very, um, very good to hear. And I want to thank you very much for that. And um, I look forward to doing more programs with you in the future. OK, but for now, I just want to say uh, thank you for doing this tonight. And it'll like I said before, it will be on our YouTube channel in just a few days. And, um, you know, go forward and do our best to benefit everybody. Okay. Thanks for having me and appreciate the opportunity. And anytime you need me, let me know. Uh, these are wonderful and it's always awesome to have this opportunity. Thank you, Great. everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night.